I'm here today with Greg Potter, a chronobiologist. And for those of you that don't know what that means, he will soon explain. Greg, nice to meet you. What have you done so far today for your health and performance? Hi, Nick. First, thanks very much for the opportunity. I haven't done anything particularly unusual today. I have been out and exercised. The gyms are open once again in England, which is very exciting. And I've eaten very well. I'm testing a product that my company, Resilient Nutrition, will hopefully be launching soon. So that's probably one thing. And then also I do certain things related to productivity as well. So for example, I use self-control, which is a website blocking app on my Mac. And I generally keep my phone in another room on airplane mode. And then finally, shortly before this podcast, I did a meditation. And those are probably the main things. We have surprising overlap there. I also use the self-control app and keep my phone on airplane mode as much as possible. My girlfriend really resents that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so what got you into chronobiology? What is chronobiology and what's your background? Chronobiology is the study of time in living beings. And... All living beings, of course, evolved in the presence of relatively predictable changes in the environment, the most prominent of which is the light-dark cycle. And to thrive in these changing environments, they evolved their own so-called biological clocks. And it's these clocks that produce rhythmic changes in various processes in our bodies. And these occur at many different levels. So the most obvious is the sleep-wake cycle. But you could look at individual organs and find quite clear rhythms in some processes. So, for example, there are roughly 24-hour changes in the digestive system. And you can look at individual cells as well. So it's likely that every single cell in our bodies contains its own molecular timekeeping mechanism, the purpose of which is presumably to separate incompatible processes and if you just think in terms of energy efficiency, then by analogy, it would be hard to drive a car and repair it at the same time and keep refueling it. Trying to do everything all at once would be very energetically costly. So by separating these processes, our bodies are more efficient. And I can go on a deep dive about that stuff, but just to come to the other aspects of your question i became interested in chronobiology and sleep relatively early in life i became interested in exercise and nutrition first starting at the age of 12 and i did degrees in sport and exercise science at loughborough university and then it was around that time that i became most interested in sleep and circadian rhythms in particular and circadian rhythms are these rhythmic changes in our bodies that recur roughly every 24 hours or so. So I mentioned the sleep-wake cycle, but there are also roughly 24-hour changes in things such as body temperature and numerous other processes too. And I realized during my undergrad degree that sleep and biological rhythms are hugely important to all facets of our health and performance. So I began looking at PhD opportunities to study sleep and circadian rhythms and came across one at the University of Leeds where I ended up doing my PhD on the intersection between circadian rhythms, sleep, nutrition and metabolic health. So it spans several fields which in retrospect I'm grateful for because fundamentally I'm interested in how to help people feel and perform better and I think that having some understanding of all those different things, everything from exercise to nutrition, sleep and skating rhythms to various different aspects of the environment, relationships and so on, all meaningfully affect our health and function from one day to the next. Was there a specific moment that you remember realizing, oh, sleep is vital for optimal health and performance? I don't think there was, but... I do remember 
poking around and reading papers during my undergrad degree for the first time. So I came across work by people such as the late Bill Dement, William Dement, who did a lot of the early sleep research. And I also recall listening to certain podcasts. I was probably an early adopter and I was listening to health podcasts back around 2010. There weren't many around then, but I remember podcasts such as the Fitcast. And Mm -hmm. I think the first person who's very interested in sleep that I came across was Dan Pardee, who ironically I ended up doing some work with around the end of my PhD. And people might be familiar with Dan. He used to have a company called Dan's Plan, which is now Human OS. And I worked as the content director at Human OS. So I produced courses on things such as chronobiology. I wrote various blogs about subjects such as sleep and nutrition. And I remember listening to Dan speak about sleep, and this was probably 2011 or so, and just finding it all so fascinating. And it's one of those subjects where the more that you learn about it, the more interesting you realize it is. And at some point, I just became hooked. And now it's it's by no means my only interest, and I probably spend as much time looking into nutrition and various other aspects of our lifestyles but I'm very happy to see that people's interest in sleep has surged in recent years as is true of chronobiology and I personally have experienced that my own sleep probably has the most dramatic effect on how I feel and perform from one day to the next. Of course, now I have to ask, how much do you sleep and what do you do to optimize your sleep environment? (laughs) So my sleep is by no means perfect. I do various things to set myself up for sleeping well. And I honestly practice what I preach, but I'm somebody who has quite unusual sleep in some ways. So for one, I've always been a very, very early chronotype. And for the listeners who aren't familiar with the word chronotype, we're all along a spectrum of preferred sleep-wake timing. So you might know peers who are the same age as you, same biological sex, who prefer going to bed much earlier or much later than you do. And for me, I've always been a real morning lark. And I can recall being four years old or so and asking my parents if I could go to bed yet, which is the exact opposite of how most youngsters are. (laughs) They all want to stay up later. But I suspect that I probably have some slightly unusual genetic variants in some genes that influence sleep weight timing. So that's one unusual aspect of my sleep. But then also in recent years, as my workload has increased, I've realized that I do experience bouts of insomnia from time to time. And I've probably had those periods throughout my life, but it's only when I began to understand sleep better that I realized that at times I I have clinically diagnosable insomnia and the good news is that now because i understand something about how insomnia is treated i can catch the progression to insomnia early in its course and prevent it from becoming a bigger problem than it needs to be but in terms of what i do to set myself up for sleep i'll just mention a few habits that i think are relevant to everyone so if we first consider the daytime then I have a self-regulation stress management practice. I think I've meditated every day this year, apart from one day I recently broke that streak, unfortunately. But I typically meditate relatively early in the day, within half an hour or so of waking for 10 minutes, sometimes later in the day too. I spend plenty of time outdoors in daylight and am physically active, so 
on average, I'll probably get something like 13,000 steps a day and go to the gym four days a week or so. And right now I'm not really doing any endurance exercise, but I've been through phases recently where I've been doing a fair bit of running too. And that's all important for various reasons. One is that I mentioned circadian rhythms earlier and circadian means about 24 hours. If you, Nick, went and lived in a cave for several days, devoid of any time cues, so you didn't know what time of day it is outside, you didn't know whether the sun was up or down, you weren't exposed to fluctuating levels of light, you had access to food on a regular basis round the clock, and there was no variation in the size of those meals and snacks and there were no changes in temperature, then what you would find is that if you measured the timing of your body's clock, it wouldn't be precisely 24 hours. For most people, it would be closer to 24 hours and 12 minutes. For some people, it would be less than 24 hours, but for most people, it would be longer than 24 hours. And what that means is that each day, we need to give our bodies strong time cues to synchronize our body's clocks with the 24-hour light-dark cycle. And the most important of those time cues is exposure to light. So during the daytime, it's really important to get outside in daylight. And interestingly, the stronger the daytime light signal that you experience, the less likely light at night is to negatively affect your sleep. So in recent times, lots of people have become very interested in using things like blue light filtering devices, and blue blocking glasses to reduce their exposure to short wavelength light at night. And I think much of the time that's unnecessary and a lot of people should instead focus on getting more light during the day. And obviously light's important to all sorts of things too. So it's not only important to circadian alignment, which I was just mentioning, it's also key to things such as mood, some aspects of cardiometabolic health. So when you get outside in daylight, your body will mobilize some nitric oxide reserves, which will help improve the function of your blood vessels, reduce blood pressure and so on. Obviously, UVB radiation is very important to vitamin D synthesis and having enough vitamin D is key, not only to things like bone mineral metabolism, but also immune function, which is very topical given that we live during the COVID-19 outbreak and many other biological processes too. So light exposure is really important. Anyway. When you say light exposure, mm. does it matter which, like what time you're getting that exposure? Do I need to sun gaze and see the first rays of light or is any time in the morning acceptable? So I think most people don't need to overthink this. But with that said, yes, it does matter. And the reason that it matters is that the time of day at which you're exposed to light will influence how it changes the timing of your body's clock. So what I mean by that is that if you, Nick, wake up naturally, well-rested, and you go outside and there's bright daylight, sun's high in the sky, and you're outside for two hours after waking, and then you spend the rest of the day in darkness, what you would find is that that high intensity, short wavelength light early in your waking day would anchor your body's clock early. So if you were somebody who was a real night owl and you therefore struggled at work because each day you had to wake up to an alarm and you were therefore compressing your sleep opportunity and you were constantly restricting your sleep, then shifting your body's clock earlier would help you fall asleep earlier, which will help expand your sleep opportunity and therefore be better rested and a better version of yourself each day. At the other end of the spectrum, what happens over the course of the lifespan is that after the end of adolescence, our body's clocks tend to drift earlier and earlier, basically until we're in the grave. And what that means is that there are lots of 80-year-olds out there who find themselves nodding off at 6 p.m. and waking up much earlier than they would like, maybe as early as 3 a.m. or so. And to live in better alignment with the rest of society, they would really benefit from shifting their body's clocks later. 
So for those people, if you imagine them staying in darkness throughout their waking day, but then in the four hours or so before their typical sleep onset, if they got outside into lots of high intensity short wavelength light, so for example, being exposed to direct sunlight, then that would help shift their clocks later, thereby help them fall asleep later and wake up later. So it does matter, but what is typical in our modern context is that people of most ages will have to wake up to an alarm. It's probably less true now than it was before the pandemic, but certainly before the pandemic, about 80% of Northern Europeans, for instance, were waking up to an alarm clock each day. And for those people, just spending more time outside during daylight would help anchor their body's clocks earlier for the most part, and thereby reduce their dependence on alarm clocks to get up each day. So I hope that helps. And I, I can return to some of those behaviors if you like, but I don't know if you want to jump in here, Nick. One trick that I like when I'm traveling is to wear blue blocking glasses. If I'm going to be out and about on a plane in artificial lighting super early in the morning, say 3 a.m., mm -hmm. and I want to entrain my circadian rhythm to the new time zone, I'll wear that until the natural sunrise in whatever locale it happens to be. From your experience and research, does that make sense? Is that a good practice? It always depends on the nature of your travel. So I, I think, like I suspect you do, that that's the time at which blue blocking glasses really come into their own. And that's how I personally use them. It's during transmeridian travel. And specifically, if I'm going to be going across more than three time zones, because if you're going across fewer than three time zones, you won't really experience jet lag. And Returning to what I was saying, there's a website named jetlagrooster.com into which you can enter details of your journey. So from where you're going and to where you're going, the times of the flights and so on, and some information about your habitual sleep patterns. And what it will do is based on what I was describing earlier, which is called the phase response curve. And what I'm referring to is how your body responds to light stimuli according to the timing of your body's clock. Jet lag rooster will give you recommendations about when to expose yourself to lots of bright light and when to avoid light in order to speed the rate at which your body's clock adjusts the new time zone. So there'll be a simple chart that's put out by the website and it might say something like, well, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., you want to avoid light. So that would be the time of day at which you want to wear those blue blocking glasses. But there might be a period shortly before, shortly after that, in which it's really important that you expose yourself to lots of high intensity, short wavelength light. So get outside, glasses off in daylight to help speed your adjustment. And there are various other things that you can do too. So depending on the nature of your travel, you can supplement with melatonin to speed synchronization to new time zone. In general, if you align your physical activity with when you're exposing yourself to light, you can speed the rate at which you adjust the new time zone. Because it does seem that physical activity per se is a time cue for our biological clocks. And that hasn't been as well studied as light exposure, but there's been some nice work in recent times by scientists such as Sean Youngstead showing that. So I think those are probably some of the core considerations when it comes to aligning two new time zones. But just to give people a couple of other tips, one would be that your first full day in the new time zone, it's really important to shift your meal times fully to the new time zone. And that's because whereas the most important time cue for most of our body's clocks is the light dark cycle, it seems that our eating fasting cycles also serve as time cues for some so-called peripheral clocks in our circadian systems. And it's probably worth me just briefly mentioning that we have a hierarchy of clocks within our bodies. And there's a so-called master clock in the brain 
And you can think of that as being a bit like the conductor in an orchestra. It helps keep the other clocks in the orchestra in time. And you then have all of the clocks outside of that master clock in the brain, and these are the peripheral clocks. So returning to nutrition, it seems that when we eat and when we fast, it's very important setting the timing of some of these peripheral clocks. That's been very clearly demonstrated in non-human animals, beginning at the turn of the millennium. There was a lady named Francesca Damioli who did some really nice work showing that if you shift the time of day at which rodents have access to nutrition by 12 hours, then the timing of the expression of various genes and organs such as the liver will shift by 12 hours within days of that change in when they have access to food. And then more recently in humans, there's been some work showing that shifting meal timing will influence things such as the timing of expression of some genes in some blood cells and also in some outputs such as the blood sugar rhythm in our bodies, which suggests that various different cells are important to the regulation of that rhythm. So think of things like the pancreas, probably also influenced by meal timing. So shifting your meal times can be really helpful too. And then otherwise, I think during the flight itself, you also want to do some simple things to avoid travel fatigue and to recognize that you're going to be exposed to lots of new pathogens. And that's one of the reasons why people are more susceptible to infections when they travel by plane. So just being careful about things like hand hygiene can be really helpful as well. And trying to make the whole journey as comfortable as possible and include things like stopovers and stay well hydrated because you're going to be exposed to lots of dry carbon air can all be really helpful. So that's a bit of a jet lag tangent, but hopefully that helps some people. Yeah, and speaking of jet lag tangents, I'll talk about my protocol that I use to lessen the jet lag burden and curious to hear your thoughts on it. So I will start trying to shift my circadian rhythm a couple days in advance if it's going to be an eight, nine hour time zone change. And I'll do that by altering my light exposure, my meal timings to an extent. And then unlike most people who put blue blocking glasses on at night, if I'm traveling early in the morning, I'll wear those, like, like I was saying earlier, until I get to the airport and start traveling and the sun rises in the destination time zone, and then I'll take them off. Then once I land, I try and get access to some grass or some kind of surface in which I can ground, and I'll do some light movement, either stretching, mobilizations, yoga, and then I'll have a breakfast, which I don't usually do, but when I'm traveling to try and adjust faster, I do that and skip lunch and then have dinner. Yeah, I, I think there are some good tips in there, but just re returning to my suggestion, I think it always depends on, on the nature of the travel. And for that reason, the, the best protocol probably varies according to the specifics of your journey. But just to pick up on a couple of things that you mentioned, one is skipping meals. I actually think that for the people who like the idea of using intermittent fasting, by which I mean periodically fasting for 24 hours or more. I'm not referring to time-restricted eating, which I think of as being somewhat distinct. I think that <clears throat> jet lag is a ideal time at which to practice intermittent fasting because the quality of plain food is often not especially high. And by going that period without food, it might make sense because you're not going to be particularly physically active while you're sat on a plane. And also, I suspect, and, and this is entirely theoretical, that if you have a fast and then your first full day in the time zone, you fully shift your meal times to the new time zone, I think that the preceding fast might speed the rate at which your peripheral clocks adjust to new time zone. You're giving your body a really strong time cue following that fast, which will help flatten some rhythms in those peripheral tissues. So I think that can be handy. And then you mentioned grounding, and it's not something that's been well studied. It's also not something that I've spent a lot of time looking at. But based on the low quality research done to date, 
I suspect there's some merit to it. And there's also been a little bit of research looking at the effects of grounding during sleep on things such as recovery following damaging exercise. And there is some evidence that in placebo controlled conditions, grounding during sleep might help improve things like muscle recovery following very damaging exercise, by which I mean things that produce lots of delayed onset muscle soreness. So think of exercise such as running downhill or doing high volumes of resistance training. There was a study that circulated in the health world a long time ago about the impact of meal timing on blood sugar response. And I'm actually currently wearing a continuous glucose monitor made by a company called Nutrisense. And I'm now testing to see how eating the same meal at different times throughout the day results in different blood glucose effects. But what do you know from your research on the interplay between blood sugar when you eat? There's been quite a lot of research on this subject in recent times. And we understand a fair bit about the bases of time of day fluctuation in responses to standardized meals. So for example, if you look at insulin sensitivity, then it's substantially higher at 8 a.m. than it is at 8 p.m. And that means that your body's going to be able to better handle a glucose load in the morning than it is at night. There's that, but more practically, there's been some work looking at how you can use an understanding of our body's clocks to optimize nutrition according to time of day. And this discipline is known as chrononutrition. And <clears throat> there are a few different practical tips that I often find myself, myself giving people based on the research done so far. So for one, I think if you're relatively inactive, concentrating much of your energy and carbohydrate intake early in your eating period or your caloric period each day makes a lot of sense. So there have been very well controlled studies in populations such as people who have type 2 diabetes showing that if you compare how people respond over the space of several weeks to when they have most of their calories at the first meal of the day, most of their carbohydrates at the first meal of the day, to another group that spreads out their calorie and carbohydrate intakes more evenly over the course of the day, then the responses of the first group are much better. They lose body weight, whereas the other group wouldn't necessarily lose body weight. And that's when the number of calories are controlled for each day. So when these people are given standardized diets, their blood sugar is dramatically better. So I'm thinking specifically of a study that found that people who have diabetes spent 83% more time within a healthy blood sugar range when they were on that earlier eating pattern than when they spread out their intakes more. And there are also various improvements in other measures of cardiometabolic health too. So things like blood lipids and blood pressure and so on. So I think there are good reasons to concentrate a lot of your carbohydrates early in the day. The thing that modifies that, of course, is exercise. And interestingly, if you look at how your exercise performance varies over the course of the day, then it depends on the type of exercise that you're doing, but it's certainly clear that strength and power exercise, I think of lifting weights or sprinting or jumping, is ideally done in the late afternoon. So we're typically strongest and most powerful, maybe something like 5 or 6 p.m. The reason for that is that our core body temperature is highest at that time of day. Body temperature is involved in all sorts of different determinants of performance in that type of exercise. So as some examples of that, the fluid in our joints is less viscous at higher temperatures. Various enzymes that are involved in energy metabolism work faster at higher temperatures. 
the speed at which our nerves can conduct action potentials is higher, our higher temperatures. And so because of all of those changes, we're stronger at that time of day. So if you're trying to optimize your exercise timing to maximize your performance and your adaptations to say training in the gym, then it would make sense to do that relatively late in your day, in which case the exercise stimulus is going to potently affect things such as non-insulin dependent glucose uptake. So what that means is that while if you were sedentary, your body would be much better at handling carbohydrate early in the day, if you're exercising at 5 p.m., then the morning, afternoon, evening difference in your blood sugar regulation is going to be much smaller because of that exercise bout. So I think in that context, it's fine to consume much of your carbohydrate later in the day. What kind of difference does it make to work out in the optimal window? for strength or power? Are we talking about a 5% difference, a 1% difference? Mm -hmm. And if what we understand about it is that it's occurring through increased body temperature, could we just stimulate something similar with a sauna practice or Mm -hmm. something that elevates the core body temperature? It depends on what you're looking at. And it also depends on when somebody habitually exercises. So while if you take somebody who's untrained, the difference in their strength at the time of day which core body temperature is lowest and the time of day which it's highest is typically something like eight percent if you have somebody who is used to training in the morning when core body temperature is relatively low then their muscles will learn to anticipate exercise at that time of day and in part because of those changes the morning afternoon difference in performance is going to be smaller Hmm. and with respect to the second part of your question it's clear that if somebody is training a a suboptimal in inverted commas time of day then if they make sure that their warm-up raises their core body temperature substantially they can help reduce the deterioration in performance that they experience relative to the best time of day so if you're training very early in the day it's really important to spend plenty of time warming up raise your core body temperature and and that will help you be at your best and then finally an implication of all of this of course is that if you are an athlete whether recreational or professional and you're getting ready for an important competition you want to align your training times with whenever you're going to be competing. And there are extreme examples. Think of a boxer who is fighting late at night. That person wouldn't want to get used to training in the morning. And then all of a sudden the fight rolls around and and they're in the ring at 11 PM. They wouldn't perform at their best. So it's important to gradually transition towards the competition time as the competition is offline earlier we were talking about some of the different performance impacts of sleep and chronobiology and you mentioned one specific example of nba players just said that in passing because it's entertaining but jason jones who's at stony brook university in new york did a study a few years ago in which he looked at players activity on twitter the night before matches in NBA players. And specifically, he looked at tweets between, I think it was 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. as a proxy of people sleeping poorly. And perhaps unsurprisingly, he found that people who tweeted during that period performed worse the next day. So they scored fewer points. They played less. So they experienced less time on court following late night tweets and their shooting accuracy was particularly negatively affected. So that's just one example of how you can use data from social media and devices in a way that provides insights to things that are of interest to many people. Back on the topic of nutrition and chronobiology, Are there any times we should or shouldn't be eating? As is normally the case, I think this really depends on the person. But in terms of general heuristics, there are a few that I typically recommend. 
So there's been a real increase in interest into time-restricted eating and the definition of that varies according to the person you're speaking to, but I typically define that as consuming all calorie containing items in a period of 12 hours or less each 24 hour day. And so people will have heard of things like the 16, eight diet, which isn't really a diet, but that entails fasting for 16 hours and then consuming all foods each day within an eight hour period. That's one way to go about it. And I think, for most people, most of the time, confining calories within a period of six to 12 hours each day is reasonable. I think people should probably avoid consuming calories in the 30 minutes or so after waking. Depends on when you wake relative to when you would like to wake up. So if you have to wake to an alarm and you would have preferred to wake an hour later, then I'd probably wait an hour and a half. So I'd say at least half an hour after you would naturally wake up before consuming calories. And then I would suggest that people stop consuming calories at least two hours before their planned bedtime. And there are several reasons for that. But there's a little bit of evidence showing that when people consume a smaller proportion of daily energy intake late in the day, their sleep tends to be a little bit more restorative as assessed by looking at activity in the autonomic nervous system, which is that automatic branch of the nervous system that's involved in various essential bodily functions. So I think those are good starting points, but then there are some other key things. So one is, I think, having a regular caloric period or eating period from one day to the next is important. And there's been some nice work on this by researchers such as Ian MacDonald at the University of Nottingham showing that if you take healthy young people through two conditions and in one condition, the people eat all of their meals at a similar time each day and they have a fixed number of meals each day. In the other condition, they have a varying number of meals each day but the total number of meals they have over the space of a couple of weeks is the same, then the group that has the fixed number of meals each day has better appetite regulation, they burn more calories after eating, and they have some improvements in some aspects of metabolic health too. So I think regular meal timing is helpful. Then I would say I typically recommend that people wait three to six hours between meals or snacks. I think a lot of people snack mindlessly. And I don't think snacking per se is bad if somebody's snacking on something which is quite nutritious and they're doing so in a mindful way. So they're sitting down, they're paying attention to what they're eating and so on. But because much of the time that's not the case, I think for a lot of people doing away with snacks is a good move. And interestingly, if you look at the research from time-restricted eating, it seems that just implementing time-restricted eating will reduce snacking, both of more processed foods and less processed foods. So I think that's a useful tip for a lot of people. And then in terms of the distribution of what you're eating within that caloric period each day, as I said earlier, if you're relatively inactive, then I think it makes sense to concentrate a lot of your calories in the first half of that eating period. If you're very physically active, I think that's less important, especially if you exercise relatively late in the day. In that case, I think it's fine to consume a lot of your calories and carbohydrates relatively late in that caloric period. And then I also think that there are a couple of specific factors to consider. So one is obviously you want to go to bed neither hungry nor full if you want to sleep well. Some other things that are relevant to sleep, of course, are caffeine consumption, and typically recommend that people stop consuming caffeine by about eight hours before their planned sleep period. So if you're planning to go to bed at 10 p.m., then you'd stop by 2 p.m. There's massive variation between people in how they respond to caffeine. So if you look at the half-life of caffeine, which is the time that it takes for the amount of caffeine in the blood to reduce by 50% relative to its peak, then for some people, the half-life is 
less than five hours on average it's about five to six hours for other people if you take someone for instance who has some sort of liver pathology that impairs caffeine metabolism then the half-life could be more than 24 hours so for that person it's really important to minimize caffeine intake but i think eight hours is a good starting point and then there of course is alcohol as well a lot of people think of alcohol as being an effective nightcap and when people drink they will tend to fall asleep faster and they'll spend a greater proportion of the early sleep period in the deeper stage of sleep which sounds attractive to some people but later in the sleep period their sleep will tend to break up and that's for a few reasons one is that alcohol is a diuretic so it will make people need to go to the toilet in the middle of the night that's going to negatively affect sleep another is that alcohol is a muscle relaxant and what that means is that for many of us after we drink the muscles of the throat will relax more during the sleep period and will end up snoring or if somebody has sleep apnea then the alcohol will exacerbate their sleep apnea and unsurprisingly regular alcohol intake does dispose people to developing sleep apnea over time sleep apnea is a common sleep disorder that's characterized by intermittent collapse of the upper airway which leads to intermittent hypoxia activation of the fight or flight branch of the nervous system and a variety of negative consequences including things like daytime sleepiness but also substantially increased risk of various cardiometabolic problems such as diabetes so i think cutting alcohol consumption at least four hours before bed is just about doable for most people who are partial to drinking i think certainly three hours before bed is doable but the earlier the better and as is true of caffeine the more alcohol that you consume the earlier you'll want to finish it because the dose will influence how long it takes your body to metabolize it so if you're having a bit of a session then it's better to have that in the morning or the afternoon than it is late in the day if you value your sleep. Isn't alcohol a potent blocker of an entire phase of sleep called REM? The data are a little bit mixed on that, but it does seem to reduce REM sleep. So it's probably worth briefly describing sleep stages for people. If you look at sleep over the course of the night, let's say that somebody has seven hours of sleep, then sleep is a very dynamic process and it varies over the course of that seven hour period and in somebody who is a healthy sleeper what will happen is during the daytime they'll build up lots of pressure to sleep and the main correlate of that is a chemical named adenosine which is like a chemical barometer of how long you've been awake and the more adenosine that you build up the more pressure there will be to sleep and as an aside, caffeine blocks the interaction of adenosine with its receptor, which is why it offsets sleepiness and promotes alertness. But if somebody's built up lots of adenosine during the day, they've been physically active and they haven't consumed too much caffeine, then that's going to help them fall asleep quickly and sleep deeply early in the night. So just going through the sleep period, what will happen is when somebody first starts to nod off, they will enter the first stage of so-called non-REM sleep. And that's a bit like a bridge between wakefulness and sleep. They'll then typically go into stage two non-REM sleep, which is characterized by certain features such as sleep spindles, which are important to learning. And that's the stage of sleep that we spend the majority of the night in. It's often something like 45% of the sleep period. From there, somebody will go into non-REM stage three sleep, which is also known as slow wave sleep. And that is the deeper stage of sleep. By deep, what I mean is that it's hard to awake somebody from it. And during that transition from stage one to stage two to stage three, things like breathing will slow down. You'll see a drop in blood pressure too. And the patterns of electrical activity in the brain will change. And this stage three deep sleep, slow wave sleep is characterized by these high amplitude synchronous brain waves that begin just above 
the bridge of the nose and sweep backwards through the brain. And those waves are very important to things such as clearing metabolic debris that's accumulated with prior wakefulness from the brain. The brain has its own immune system. And it's during this stage of sleep that the plumbing in that system opens up, allowing a lot of that debris to be disposed of. But this stage of sleep is also very important to things such as bodily restoration. It's when our bodies produce much of their growth hormones. That's important to remodeling connected tissues such as tendons and ligaments and skin. And this stage of sleep is also very important to the development of memory, both in the brain and in the immune system. So interestingly, if somebody is just being vaccinated, then you could probably somewhat predict their responses to the vaccination on the basis of their slow wave sleep around the time that they're vaccinated. From that deeper stage of sleep, people often ascend to a light stage of sleep and then they'll go into REM sleep, which you mentioned. And that is rapid eye movement sleep. So named because of the way that the eyes move from side to side during the stage of sleep, sometimes called paradoxical sleep, because while parts of the brain are as much as 30% more metabolically active than they are during the daytime, many of the skeletal muscles in our bodies are completely paralyzed, which is presumably to stop us from acting out our dreams. And it's during this stage of sleep when we do most of our dreaming, the stage of sleep is important to bodily processes such as cardiovascular health, but it's also key to emotion regulation and to helping us understand the world. You can think of it as being a bit like an opportunity to simulate the outside world and to explore different ways of existing in it and connections between things. And as an aside, humans have less total sleep but more REM sleep than the rest of the primates and it's quite possible that that change in our sleep structure has been very important to the development of things like intelligence and returning to a question about alcohol the reason alcohol can disrupt REM sleep in particular is that these sleep stages aren't evenly distributed over the course of the sleep period so during the early stage of sleep We've had lots of that adenosine chemical accumulating during the day. That's created lots of pressure to sleep. And that leads to lots of slow wave activity. So it really strongly promotes the deeper stage of sleep. But as the night progresses, each sleep cycle, and these sleep cycles take place maybe every 90 to 110 minutes or so, is characterized by a reduction in time spent in the deeper stage of sleep and what that means is that by the end of the sleep period, so shortly before you wake up, you'll be spending proportionately more time in rapid eye movement sleep. And that's why you're more likely to remember your dreams in the morning than if you wake up in the middle of the night. And because alcohol is breaking up sleep late in the sleep period as your body metabolizes the alcohol and because the alcohol is leading to urination and so on, it's more likely to disrupt REM sleep and that might explain things such as the fact that a lot of people are quite irritable the day after they've been drinking alcohol because they've been disrupting rapid eye movement sleep, which is so important to emotion regulation. I've heard REM sleep referred to as the information alchemy stage of sleep. Mm. And it seems that most of us so-called biohackers looking to enhance sleep quality are talking and focusing more on deep sleep. And I'm surprised that there's less mainstream interest in REM sleep. Yeah, and it is possible to do things that will differentially affect these different stages of sleep. So if you were somebody who was trying for whatever reason, and I'm not recommending this, but if you're trying to maximize the amount and intensity of deep sleep that you were getting, then energy metabolism during the day is really important. So being physically active, heating your body, those types of behaviors will promote more of that deeper stage of sleep. Conversely, if you were trying to hack in inverted commas REM sleep, then there are certain things that you can do to influence it. And the most important one is just getting enough total sleep, recognizing that most of your REM sleep comes late in the sleep period. 
So a lot of people will have experienced so-called COVID dreams in recent times. The reason for that is likely in part that lots of people have had very strong emotions. Maybe they've lost loved ones or maybe they're frightened for various reasons. Maybe they're under lots of stress because they've lost a job. Our daytime experiences influence our dreams. So that will in part explain their COVID dreams or nightmares and nightmares have increased in prevalence of late. But at the same time, most of us have more control over our schedules now than we did previously because we're not commuting to work and so on. So we can sleep in longer. So we're more likely to wake up our dreams. Hence the fact that we recall more of those vivid dreams than we did previously. But in terms of influencing REM sleep, if you get enough time in bed so you don't wake to an alarm, then that's going to help you hack REM sleep. And then also... There are things that you can do, such as lucid dreaming training, that do seem to have some utility for certain clinical outcomes. And there hasn't been a great deal of research on this. There's been a little bit on PTSD and a little bit on insomnia. I really enjoyed reading a paper by Jason Ellis on this. He published some work last year looking at the effects of a brief lucid dreaming training intervention on insomnia. And... It was just a two week long intervention in which he took people who have insomnia and had them go through a series of simple exercises. I won't detail all the specifics, but it involved things like reality checks during the day. So people would set alarms to go off every hour during wakefulness. And each hour they would look at their hands and they would ask themselves if they were awake or asleep. And the reason is that some people will then experience a dream in which they look at their hands and they'll realize that they're dreaming so those reality checks can be helpful they also did things such as visualization so while they were lying in bed at night before they went to sleep they would picture the type of dream that they wanted to have and they kept dream diaries that seems to be particularly important for people who are trying to learn to lucid dream so as soon as they woke in the morning They would note their dreams in as much detail as possible. And then they also use something called auto-suggestion, which basically is trying to recognize unusual elements of dreams that reoccur in dreams from night to night, and then use those unusual elements to cue lucid dreaming. And when people went through this type of lucid dreaming training, they, they did lucid dreams slightly more frequently and i probably should have first made it clear that lucid dreaming is an unusual state in which somebody is conscious that they're dreaming during a dream and for some people that means that they can then take control of the dream and do all sorts of fun stuff in their dreams (laughs) and one of the problems in insomnia is that their dreams are typically more negatively valenced than in healthy people. So they're more likely to have nightmares than people who don't have insomnia. So if you could take control over the dream, then you could change the course of the dream for the better, and that would potentially influence next day waking function. And anyway, long story short, the people who have insomnia had quite dramatic improvements in the severity of their insomnia after the simple brief intervention. So Lucid dreaming training definitely has some clinical utility. I don't think we understand how to fully optimize it. And I suspect that it would be best incorporated with some other sleep interventions to maximize its results. There are also potentially some supplements that might influence the ability to lucid dream. Not well studied at all, but I think some cholinergic supplements will probably influence it. There's some evidence showing that an Alzheimer's drug named galantamine can influence dream lucidity, for instance. It's plausible to me that some acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, so something like huperzine A, might also influence lucidity. It hasn't been studied to my knowledge, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend those. But yes, I think hacking REM sleep does have some potential. It always depends on what you're trying to accomplish though and i wouldn't necessarily recommend hacking it just for the sake of hacking it and instead people should focus on a lot of the core sleep health behaviors which you haven't actually really touched on but i know you started by asking me about 
what some things I do on a regular basis to sleep well are. And I, I probably got into about two of them and then and then we, we got off on a bit of a tangent. So I don't know if you want to return to some of those. Yeah, we could return to those. Okay. So there are some really simple ones. I mentioned light exposure and physical activity. I also mentioned meditation. So having some sort of stress management practice. Those are all handy. And I also discussed some nutritional considerations. So if we come to the pre-sleep period, then having a regular wind down routine is a course key. And it doesn't need to be anything long, doesn't need to be hugely structured, but putting aside one to two hours before bed in which to actively wind down is instrumental if you want to sleep well and you're struggling with your sleep. Good activities to do during this time would include things such as reading a book and listening to music that you find relaxing. Obviously, you don't want to listen to anything too loud and too jarring. It would also entail avoiding things that you find distressing. So it's not the time of day at which to have an argument with your spouse, if avoidable. It's also not a time of day at which to go scrolling mindlessly through social media or exposing yourself to lots of negative news, watching a TV series or film that you find distressing. So I, I think the content of your exposure is key at that time. And I think there are a few things to consider with screen. So one is that if we're looking at TVs or laptops or phones, there's the light exposure from the screen, which is a consideration. Honestly, I don't think that it's particularly important in the grand scheme of things, but there's no harm in dimming the brightness settings on your devices at that time. You could use blue blocking glasses at this period if you wanted, but I would just recommend that people dim some lights in their home beginning one to two hours before bed. So that might entail turning some lights off. If you have dimmers, use those. It's actually most important to minimize overhead lighting specifically, and that's because of where the cells in the eyes that are very responsive to this type of light are concentrated. They're concentrated in the lower part of the retina. So it's overhead light, and that makes sense evolutionarily, obviously, but it's overhead light that can be most alerting and disruptive to our body's clocks. So just keep on lamps and things at this time. And... <clears throat> In terms of some other habits, having a hot shower about an hour before bed is a really helpful thing for a lot of people. The reason is that if you have a hot shower, say 10 degrees Celsius, sorry, 40 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. beginning about an hour to an hour and a half before bed, and you then get out of the shower put on some socks as silly as that sounds. And what you'll do is you raise the temperature of your skin and your extremities, so your hands and your feet in particular, by a couple of degrees. And what that will do, perhaps counterintuitively, is help you radiate heat out from your core. And that will help reduce the temperature of your brain. And a drop in brain temperature seems to be particularly key to helping speed sleep onset. So when people have a hot shower at that time, they'll tend to fall asleep a little bit faster and also improve their sleep quality a little bit too. So I think that can be key. And then maybe half an hour or so before bedtime, I typically recommend avoiding screens. And I mentioned light exposure, but there's also the content of whatever you're exposed to. But then the loss of sense of time, I think, is particularly important to recognize. So if you're watching something on Netflix and it's on autoplay, then it's, it's really easy to look up three hours later and not realize that a lot of time has gone by <laughs> and all of a sudden you're past when you plan to go to sleep. So I think those are some really good starting points for a lot of people during that time, there are a couple of strategies that people who are really struggling with their sleep can use, which are particularly helpful. So one of these is just making a to-do list a couple of hours before bed. And that might be listing everything that you need to get done the next day in as much detail as is necessary. Among people who are experiencing insomnia, that will help them fall asleep faster because what you're really doing is 
getting rid of things that would be on your mind that you might otherwise go to bed thinking about and therefore disturb your sleep. And then for people who are very stressed, I think doing some problem solving around dinner time is really helpful in the form of scheduled worry time. Sounds strange mm -hmm. to a lot of people, but what it typically entails is sitting down with pen and a piece of paper for 20 minutes or so in the left hand column you just list something you're concerned about right now and in the right hand column list the smallest next thing that you can do to address that concern and if there's nothing you can do about what you're worried about just list that the idea is that at the end of that practice you then commit to not worrying about things until your scheduled worry time the next day so you're trying to concentrate your worries at that time of day so that those worries don't surface around the time you go to bed because for a lot of people they're very busy during the day and that can suppress their ruminations and their concerns but then when they take their foot off the accelerator at the end of the day a lot of those worries will start to rise to the surface so i think that's handy and then in terms of the actual sleep period only go to bed if you're sleepy save the bed for sex and sleep only don't spend lots of time in bed awake. So if you're struggling with your sleep, stick to the 15 to 20 minute rule. What I mean is if you've been in bed and it's been roughly 15 minutes or so, don't look at the clock, but just going by time in your head. You want to get out of bed, go to a different room, do something relaxing and dim lighting, and then only return to bed when you're sleepy. So you might go through to the living room and read a book in dim lighting and then as you start to feel drowsy again, return to bed. The idea is that that way you're learning to reassociate your bed with somewhere that you're asleep. And what happens in insomnia in particular is that people spend lots of time in bed awake. And because our brains are so good at creating associations between things, the brain learns to associate being in bed with being awake. So they need to recondition themselves to strengthen the connection between the bed and sleep and that would be really handy for those people and another tip that's particularly instrumental for people who are really having a hard time sleeping is waking at a relatively regular time each day and there's a type of therapy used for people who have insomnia called bedtime restriction therapy it's not particularly well named but core component of that is fixing the wake time each day and that will help with circadian system function because you will thereby give yourself a regular time which to wake and expose yourself to time cues such as light exposure and nutrition and so on but also if you wake at a fixed time each day then you give yourself enough time to build lots of pressure to sleep at night and that will help you fall asleep quickly and stay asleep as well so while I wouldn't recommend using alarm for people whose sleep is already relatively good, for people who are really struggling with their sleep, using alarm can actually be a really instrumental part of helping them start to sleep better. Your concept of scheduling a dedicated block to worry is new to me. I'll have to give that a shot. Yeah, it's, it's really transformative for some people. It's not for everyone. If, if you're not somebody who goes to bed with a racing mind, you, you might not need to worry about it. But I think that tip has probably become relatively more helpful for a lot of us in recent times because people are stressed right now and understandably so. So if you are a worrier, there's no downside to giving it a go. Yeah. Well, Greg, we've been chatting for a while. I feel like we can go on forever. What are you working on, interested in, in researching these days? I spend most of my time working on Resilient Nutrition, which is a company that I co-founded last year. The start of the first global pandemic in my life seemed like a really good time to create a startup. And <laughs> at Resilient Nutrition, we're trying to help people eat better and thereby improve how they feel and perform. And ultimately what I'd like to do is 
create nutrition products that help counter some of the biggest diet related problems that we face. Right now, Resilient Nutrition is based in the UK, so our products are only available in the UK. Our first products are a series of delicious performance enhancing nut butters. We came out with those because Ali, my co founder, and I did some work a couple of years ago helping two guys get ready to row the Atlantic. And if you think about that context, then they need energy dense, shelf stable, nourishing foods that will support their needs over the course of several weeks at sea. And that butter is particularly well suited to that. So we started making prototypes of what's now our first product, long range fuel for them. They did really well. We don't take any credit for it, obviously, but they broke the world record. They rode the Atlantic in less than 40 days and resilient nutrition was born. So those products are now available to consumers and they come in different versions that are better suited to different times of day. And they also come in pouches, which are really handy if you're on the go and you need a meal replacement or if you're out exercising. They also come in store at home jars, which are better suited to the kitchen or the office. And we've had good traction in our target market so far. People love them. They taste fantastic and there's no nonsense in them. But obviously, we also have a pipeline of products that we're excited about releasing too. And a lot of my time right now is spent dotting the I's and crossing the T's for the next product, which I'm hoping will be available shortly. And I can't disclose too much about it, but let's just say it's relevant to some of the things we've been discussing today and there's nothing else that's quite like it as far as I can tell. So I'm pumped about that, but watch the space for the time being. And people can check out Resilient Nutrition at resilientnutrition.com. Um, Shameless plug, we're also on social media. I think the handle is at Resilient Nuts on Instagram. So a lot of my time is spent focused on that right now, but I do a little bit of other work too. So I do a fair bit of public speaking, and a lot of that has dried up in the last year or so, obviously, but still do some consultancy work with companies and individuals helping them be at their best sustainably. And right now that really takes up probably 80% of my waking life, much to the dismay of my girlfriend. You mentioned a minute ago the social media mm -hmm. handles for resilient nutrition. And if people want to get in contact with you, how can they find you on the internet? My own Instagram handle is at Greg Potter PhD. I really don't like that handle. I don't like the PhD bit. It makes me sound like I'm particularly proud of the PhD. I'm a PhD, so I'm not even a real doctor. It's just that Greg Potter was taken and that was available across different social media handles. So you can reach out to me there. I've also got a website, which is gregpotterphd.com, but that really is just a way to contact me. And I do also have a LinkedIn account under the same extension and a Twitter one, but I, I don't tweet much. I have a couple very brief rapid fire questions for you just to get your quick takes on things. Then we'll wrap up. Cool. The first one is what you think about red light and near infrared light on resetting circadian rhythm for morning light exposure. There's been a little bit of work looking at the effects of the spectrum of light on how the light affects the timing of our body's clocks. And it's very clear that short wavelength light, which to most of us would appear as blue or green, but full spectrum light, such as white light, also has a lot of that type of light in it, more strongly influences the circadian system than longer wavelengths, which include red light. So if you wanted something to reset your clock each day, red light's not going to do it. There's a terrific researcher named Yus Van Someren, I'm probably butchering his first name, is EUS, who has done a little bit of work looking at the effects of red light on sleep propensity, finding that red light exposure shortly before bed actually increases sleep propensity a little bit. So it leads people to feel a bit drowsy. It could thereby speed the rate at which people fall asleep. So I think if you're using a photobiomodulation device, 
and the only time of day at which you can use it is late in the day, it's unlikely to affect your sleep much. I wouldn't necessarily use it early in the day with a view to influencing your biological rhythms for the reasons that I just mentioned. I think that photobiomodulation definitely has its place for some things. It strikes me that a lot of the research on it is, being honest, quite low quality, not very well controlled. But if you look at the entire body of literature, then there is a lot of information suggesting that it does have positive effects. And I definitely think it has utility in helping people with conditions such as pain. So if you're somebody who experiences musculoskeletal pain that negatively affects your sleep, then I suspect that photobiomodulation could be helpful. I also think that could have positive effects on things such as mild cognitive impairment, certain skin problems, hair growth, all sorts of different things. So from a circadian biologist perspective, I don't think it's particularly interesting, but if you're somebody who wants to leverage some of those other benefits that I just mentioned, I think it definitely has its place. One of the tricky things is just navigating the different products that are out there getting something with appropriate parameters, using the device in a way that's in accordance with what the research shows to be beneficial. So it's worth first working out what you're going to use the device for, which type of parameters will be important to attend to, which devices have those parameters, and then giving it a go on a regular basis to see if it meaningfully affects the thing that you're looking to prove. Makes sense. Now imagine that there's a worldwide burning of the books and all knowledge and information on earth are gone. You get to save three works. It can be books, videos, podcasts, interviews, you name it. What would your choices be? Such a hard question. <laughs> if it was three books that I thought would help me in the future, it would probably be something like the Encyclopedia Britannica, a textbook on an important issue, so maybe one on existential threats and then something about survival. But if it was my favourites, which I think is what the question really is, then one of them would probably be The Beginning, beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. He's a physicist at Oxford who is best known for his thoughts on many worlds theory. It's an astonishingly information dense book and the ideas in it are so consequential. It's quite hard work, not because it's not written clearly, it's written impressively clearly, but only because there's so much in there that at least for me, I want to reread every paragraph about three times. Another would be Behave by Robert Sapolsky. I think if you want to understand animal behavior and human behavior in particular, and its biological bases, then that's probably the most engaging book on that subject that you'll find. And it's also a big book, so hopefully that might help me stay entertained. And then the third book is, is a bit trickier. I'd definitely pick the first two, but one of them might be Homo Deus, which is a really obvious choice. It almost feels cliche saying that, but it's a terrific book. Or maybe something by Steven Pinker, maybe Enlightenment Now. I, I think those would both keep me well entertained. Awesome. I've read Sapiens, not the others, but Greg, it's been fun chatting today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Nick. Thank you. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.